All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, hopefully you were able to hear that. We have a Bob White perched on the sign at Wakanta Prairie, which is what this webinar is going to be talking about, is Wakanta Prairie. Um, to get started, again, we are the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Um, for a little bit more about us, we work to promote conservation of birds through scientific research, population monitoring, policy advocacy, education, and outreach. Our efforts fit into the four overarching categories depicted in these eggs below, of quality habitats, feeding the flock, bird-friendly communities, and people in nature. For more information, you can look on our website at www.mervo.org. We'll put that link in the chat at some point too. Um, our presenters today are going to be Eric Ost, who is our field coordinator, Matt Longabaugh, our survey technician, and then myself, Zeb Yoko. I'm our conservation science communicator. So today we are going to be talking about Wakanta Prairie, um, but this is a Zoom webinar, so I'll give you the rundown of all of the tools that that provides. Um, we're recording this as well, so it'll be on our website afterwards. Um, and since it is a webinar, we can't see you attendees, but we do want to hear from you. So if you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the respective um, boxes on the Zoom settings. There should be a chat box for general comments, and then there's a Q&A box if you have a specific question about something. We'll answer questions at the end, but it's really helpful if you put them in that Q&A box so we can organize them better than the chat. The chat can get a little bit, uh, um, a little bit more harder to sift back through and find your questions. So put your questions in the Q&A box. There's also a raise hand function and all of these controls should be either at the top or the bottom of your screen. If you um, put the mouse there, it should pop up and you should see all of them. I may have one question for you to raise your hands on later. So that one is also in that same area. Okay, so that tells you a little bit about Zoom and then the general structure here is going to be, um, Eric is gonna lead off with the history of Wakanta. I'm going to talk about the ecology of Wakanta Prairie, and then I'm going to pass it back to Eric to talk about our projects at Wakanta uh, for our, our breeding bird surveys, our fall migration surveys, and our nest monitoring surveys. And then Matt is going to finish with um, talking about seasonal portraits or what you can see anytime you visit Wakanta and what you can expect to see there. Um, and then we will all stick around for a Q&A um, at the end. We should run about an hour. We did a practice yesterday and it should be pretty close to an hour. Uh, we should have a couple minutes for questions and we'll of course stick around for questions after that but if you have to leave we understand um, so we should be running for about an hour today and without any further ado to keep us on task i am going to pass it over to eric so take it away eric thanks a lot zeb and thanks everybody for spending this evening with us so first i want to talk a little bit about the origin and history of Wakanta. So let me get this rolling. All right. So, history of Wakanta. Here are two nice vistas, or a vista on the left, and uh, a nice wildflower shot taken in early June here at Wakanta. Lots of nice wildflowers there. So let's get into it. So what and where is Wakanta Prairie? So for those that don't know where Wakanta Prairie is, I made this map here on the right-hand side of the screen. And this orange little rectangle or square is where Wakanta is in relation to the state. And then this is the Wakanta boundary here. So you can kind of see it's in Southwest Missouri, but we'll get into the de some more details in a moment. So just a brief uh, background, Wakanta Prairie is the largest easternmost tall grass prairie in North America. And now after a new acquisition, it's at around 3,300 acres. And so what this means though, with largest easternmost tall grass prairie, east of Wakanda Prairie, there's no prairie, no tall grass prairie that's larger than it. So it's pretty remarkable. And it's the second largest, second largest prairie in the state of Missouri behind Prairie State Park, which is a little bit just a tad west, so we just beat it out by having it a little bit further east. So it's an upland prairie on the edge of the Ozarks, and as you can see in this map here, this green kind of indicates the Ozarks, and Lake of the Ozarks is right around here, so it's just on the edge, and so it's pretty hilly. And 
to help uh, signify that, you can imagine all these little riparian areas with, with more vegetation, these woodier trees. These are all the draws and lower parts of the prairie and uh, all the other parts are kind of the peaks. So uh, it's pretty hilly and also as evident of the photo I showed you uh, in the last slide. So primarily uh, underneath this prairie is a churdy silt loam soil. So chert limestone is Missouri state rock. And um, you can see right here, this is a limestone quarry that's right around El Dorado Springs. Um, but silt loam, just a little uh, get a little more technical, it's a uh, soil that's not less than 70% silt and clay and not less than 20% sand. Wakanta Prairie is a mix of remnant, which is never plowed, um, which and this is important because of, there's a lot of microbes, uh, you know, fungus, and other seeds that are kind of inactive in the soil that um, once it's plowed, you know, a lot of that is, is, is kind of removed and it takes forever, you know, a long time to get that back, uh, to get those organisms down there again. Restored prairie is you know, where it's been plowed, but there's been reseeding and other restoration efforts to kind of uh, get it back to that prairie, uh, real rich prairie state. There's savanna, so a mix of uh, kind of trees out in the prairie, and you can see right, this is a good savanna area right around in here. Mature forest, so you can see that there's some forests, little pockets of woodlots here and down here. There's some ponds around, so you know, right here's a pond, a few different ponds right around in here, and creeks. So all these little riparian areas, when there's a heavy flood, this water, water flows through here and provides great drainage for uh, the prairie and also the surrounding areas. And it's located in Cedar and St. Clair County. So here's the dividing line right here. And it's just a few miles northeast of El Dorado Springs. And right here is our field house where Matt and I are broadcasting from. All right, so uh, Wakanda's origin. So I tried to do a little bit of digging. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to, to find a lot of information on this, but um, as you probably could imagine, you know, most of this region was prairie prior to European settlement and westward expansion. And you know, we have one half of 1% of our remaining prairie left in the state. And um, so prior to European settlement, the Osage Nation and other people uh, utilized the prairie landscape. Uh, we'll skip to uh, kind of more recent decades where I found a some more information. Portions of the prairie had been used for ranching, you know, such as in this picture here. Row crops, hence some of the plowed restored prairie, uh, it probably was used to be row crops. There was a golf course situated on it, and there was even a nuclear silo during the Cold War that's now decommissioned. So then Nature Conservancy and as well as uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation started buying up tracks of Wakanta from the 1970s. And even 2020, we just added another, there's another uh, track that's added. And uh, in part, the reason, one of the reasons why they're buying parcels here in this specific location is because the upper Osage region is part of a pri uh, priority geography area indicated by the Missouri Department of Conservation. And that's important because, you know, with conservation, we, there's limited finances. So you want to try to allocate your, your money as best you can to get the most um, benefit out of your money. So they've kind of identified this area as a high potential area for uh, getting the most uh, you know, back to the environment with their purchasing power. And so just in case you want to know why Wakanta is named Wakanta, it is named in honor of the Osage Nation and it translates loosely to great spirit or great mystery. And here's that picture again, kind of just looking over Wakanta Prairie, just a portion, I mean, this is, you know, there's a, another portion way over on the other side of this hill. It's a pretty big prairie. So now skip to prairie management. So 
historically the Osage Nation uh, had prescribed fires and they'd burn huge swaths of land there. And they had bison that would graze there and help reduce uh, some of the woodier secondary growth from occurring. And now, you know, we don't have the bison and the fires are, uh, you know, not, at, we don't have as many wildfires out, out here. So what TNC and MDC does now is they manage the land cooperatively and to help uh, kind of break it, help uh, make their management more manageable, uh, they divide it into 59 units. And according to the uh, current land manager there, Stacia, um, you know, typically each unit is burned every three to five years. And you can see this picture right here. This is an area that was just burned. So there were two units here that uh, used to look like this and they just burned it. And here's an, a closer shot. And there's a fire strip here and they just burned this recently. So this is what it looked like right after a burn. They have grazers, not quite bison now, but we have um, cattle that ro uh, rotate throughout certain units. They do a lot of reseeding and seed collecting. They do woody removal. Uh, this is a good image indicating kind of what that looks like. So they'll clear a lot of the taller trees and pile up and probably burn them after. Excuse me. And then invasive species mitigation. And so I, I'm pretty sure you got this big uh, truck with this tank on the back. And I think that would be used for, um, you know, using some herbicide or some other spray. And they drive and spray some of the invasives that are present. All right, so that's a brief history about Wakanta. And now I'm gonna um, turn this back over to Zeb, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about the ecology and wildlife that uses Wakanta. Yes, I am. All right. Thanks, Eric, that was great. Um, it's really beneficial to know where it is, what it is, and what we do with at Wakanta, or what they do to make Wakanta stay on the landscape. So I'm going to pick up basically right where Eric left off with the, the habitat that is Wakanta. So again, it's the largest protected tall grass prairie area, um, which is amazing. And this graphic shows the historic extent of grasslands across the U.S. Um, I should clarify too, in the U.S. we call our grasslands prairies, though the terms can be used pretty much interchangeably. So there are three different types of prairies. You've got the tall grass prairie, which is all of the, the blue teal here. It's the easternmost part of the grasslands. And then you've got a, um, a um, transitional habitat, which is the mixed grass prairie. So it's got some of the tall grasses. And then in the dark brown here, you've got short grass prairie, which is some of the shortest grass. I mean, um, the name fits. It's the shortest grass, and it goes all the way up to the Rocky Mountains. And that's basically where the end of the grasslands occur in North America. So you can see we've lost a lot of grasslands, especially if you're thinking that if Wakanta is the, the largest easternmost uh, tall grass prairie reserve, there's a lot of tall grass prairie that should have been east of here. So there might be small patches here and there, but it's not anything like what we would expect where almost all this landscape was that with, with a little bit of difference in the, the lower wet areas. And I'll get to that in a little bit. One other classification for grasslands, um, the three major prairie types can be broken into a little bit more specific ecosystems. And this basically adds a more uh, north to south component. You can see the tall grass prairie, is it's more similar to the, to the rest of the tall grass than the other types of prairie, but there is a little bit of difference between the north and the south. You've got the northern tall grass prairies, the central tall grass prairies, and then our region is the Flint Hills and Osage Plains area, and it's the largest pr protected prairie complex in this area. Um, so, um, yeah, so we are in this Osage Plains tall grass prairie area, and it is one of the largest remaining tall grass reservations in that landscape. Um, the first thing you think of and you see when you look at a grassland or a prairie is grasses, fittingly enough. So big blue stem and little blue stem are some of the most prevalent native grasses, but there are plenty more. Um, in fact, there are 450 plus species of plants that are known to occur at Wakanta. And again, as Eric described in this picture, you've got these gently rolling hills. So in the upland areas or in the higher areas, you've got mostly these grasses with some wildflowers intermixed. And then as you get lower down into the, the the lower parts of the hills 
where that water drains to, you've got some more of the woodier vegetation, you've got your shrubs and some of the trees that'll occur. Um, so most of the area is gonna be this grass interspersed with these um, wildflowers. So um, wildflowers or forbs is another name for some of these wildflowers respond well to the management strategies that Eric mentioned because these are natural processes that occur on tall grass prairies of grazing, typically with bison, but now we use cattle. And then you have the prescribed burning or fire that, that really encourages wildflowers to come back in the following year. And some of these wildflowers that I see, again, this is gonna be a subset because I don't have time to list all 450 of them, nor do I know all 450 of them. But some of the main wildflowers you might see when you're going through a kata are Indian paintbrush, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, you've got foxgloves like this right here. Um, and then there are, of course, the comb flowers. These are going to be around. There's the purple comb flower, and then there's black eyed Susan, and the yellow or gray headed comb flower are also going to be around. And then the Leatris or blazing stars, there's a couple different species of those that'll be here. And then definitely the milkweeds too. And I'll talk about one more of these specifically later, but there's several different milk, milkweed species that occur at Wakanta. And then with all of these beautiful wildflowers around that provide resources for pollinators and also just food as the, the, the green parts are just food for other things, it leads to a lot of insects and spider populations being around. So we've got, of course, caterpillars and butterflies and especially the monarch. We do see monarchs that occur at Wakanta. Um, you've got the occasional years you have mass cicada emergences and then sometimes there, there's some annual species of cicada that are always going to be there. And then definitely in a grassland environment, you're going to see grasshoppers. And since you have all of these uh, widespread bugs, you're going to have things that eat the bugs, like these um, garden spiders. So I didn't even try and put a number. I don't know where you could even find a checklist, but I'm sure there are hundreds, if not thousands of species of insects and spiders. And I didn't even mention ticks and millipedes and all the other, other creepy crawlies. Um, but I'm gonna go a little bit further up the um, food web or a higher taxonomic order, and that's gonna be the reptiles and amphibians here. So there are a few that you will see, um, more reptiles and amphibians, more likely that you will see. Um, the, the most common one I would say, or at least the most visible one, is gonna be the box turtle. And there's two different species, maybe even a third. I, I'm a little rusty on my, my turtles, but this is gonna be, I think the ornate box turtle um, there's ornate and three-toed, which are, are there for sure, and there might be more, but box turtles are quite common. You'll see them, and make sure if you do visit the area that you don't, um, you're very cautious when you're driving around, because there's a certain time of the year where they will be migrating across the roads to set up their nests, so be very careful and be very observant. Try not to move them unless they're maybe in the middle of a road, um, but just be aware of these, these slow-moving turtles. And then the next thing are snakes. There are quite a few different species like this prairie king snake here. Um, these are, they're generally more secretive. So I've, I've been to Wakanta for a few seasons and I, you see them very rarely and they're always, um, it's a treat when you can see them. If you don't really fear snakes, it's a treat you can see them. And they are generally always trying to get out of your way. They don't want to be, um, be messed with. And then one of the really rare ones that our surveys have found in the recent years is this glass lizard. I've never seen one, so you have to be really lucky to see one. Um, I think Eric has said that they have increased in numbers in the past couple of years, which is great to hear. Um, so you might be able to see one of those as well. And then I won't dwell on the amphibians too much, but the most common ones are going to be your frogs. So this is a, a prairie leopard frog and then gray tree frogs. There are some toads that you'll see throughout too, and probably salamanders. I haven't seen any there either, unfortunately. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of that stuff. Um, and then one of the reasons we don't see the amphibians is because they don't um, they don't congregate in the areas where we do a lot of our work, which Eric will talk about more in just a little bit. Speaking of our work, the next group of um, animals is the birds. So the eBird checklist for Wakanta has about 200 species, and I should clarify there are two separate checklists because there are two separate counties that Wakanta occurs in, and there's 198 species listed in one and 166 in the other. But you can probably assume that you're going to see, you could see any of those in either different county. Um, and there was a new one added just Tuesday by our surveyors, Eric and Matt. Um, so these birds are going to be, of course, your grassland species like dick thistles and things that are going to enjoy those wonderful wildflowers. They're like these hummingbirds. Um, insectivores, because you've got all these big insects flying around, you're going to have things like scissor tail flycatcher there. And then again, things that eat the slightly smaller things like this northern harrier. 
So I'm not going to dwell too much on the birds because um, Eric and Matt have plenty more to share about them going forward. So I know we are the bird observatory, but there are other things that we talk about. And the last group of animals that I'm going to talk about in general, I'm going to get into some more specifics just after this too, but the last general group is these furry critters. And I say furry critters instead of saying mammals because there is one in this group that is not a mammal. And raise your hand if you think you know which one it is. I won't spoil it yet, but when I get to it, um, I will make a note of it. So, okay, I've got a couple people that are raising their hands. So that's great. Um, I will say that this is our, as, as we did our practice yesterday, this is probably our weakest area where I know the, the least about most of these things. I mean, the general ones you know some of, but there are several field mice and voles and shrew species that I definitely don't know anything about. Um, there are white-tailed deer, which are pretty obvious. Those are ones that we all are pretty familiar with, I would say. Um, and then there are rabbits, raccoons, of course, as well. There are some squirrels and chipmunks. You might be able to see there is a chipmunk hidden in here. Um, and they're going to be, of course, in the woodier areas. And actually, it's right there. You can see the eye, hopefully, and then you can see a little bit of the body uh, hidden behind all these, these this, this pile of sticks here. And then foxes and coyotes, there'll be some of as well. Um, and then I see the chat and the Q&A going off, so I'm going to get to this here. I might spoil it if you haven't typed it in yet, but a possum is the only one of these that's not a mammal. They are actually marsupials, and they are the only marsupial that occurs in North America. Fun little fact. And then the last couple we see very rarely, but there are some skunks that we see around. Um, and then badger, I've heard of, I, when I was down there, there was somebody that had trapped one right next to the property. And then Eric and Matt made sure to let me know that there are bobcats that they have seen around too. So that's mostly all we've got for the furry critters. And um, now I'm gonna talk about some of the really the wonderful things you can appreciate because it is such a large preserved area. And these are, um, these current and formerly endangered species or rare species. Um, the beauty of a large area of natural habitat that has not all been converted, so some of it is remnant, as, as Eric had mentioned, some more of these species um, can occur here than in other places in, in the world for that matter. So Wakanta has a few current and former endangered species that call this area home. And the first one that I've got this disclaimer this shot here of is the uh, greater prairie chicken. And so the greater prairie chicken is state endangered because there are at most hundreds remaining in the state. Um, one of the reasons that there are so few is they require really large areas of grassland just like this to go about their, their business. Um, greater prairie chickens, their, their ecology consists of during the breeding season, they'll form a lek, which is basically a giant dance arena, which is kind of as awesome as it sounds, where all of the males will gather and then they'll form this area and they'll, they'll dance and try and show off and attract a mate and attract the females. Um, so to do this, they have to have a really short area or a packed down area or maybe like a recently burned area. Um, but they wanna have some area where they can perform and then they will go hide in the grass and they really don't like to have too much woody vegetation because that encourages things like raccoons and coyotes, which can predate their nests and we don't want that. The next um, species that I have on this list, and they are federally, actually federally threatened, I was just looking at it earlier, I, that's, a mis that's a typo here, is the Meads milkweed. And these guys pretty much, it's one of the specific species of milkweed, so there are several that occur at Wakanta, but Meads milkweed is the only federally threatened one. And the reason is because they pretty much only remain on the remnant or these unplowed areas, and specifically where grazing is low, that there will be Meads milkweed. Okay, so now we're going actually back down in size. We're going smaller again. So we've got the regal fritillary. That is um, the next one here. It's a grassland obligate as well, which means they conduct their whole, all phases of their life in the grasslands. And they're very specific about what type of area they need, which is why their numbers are fairly small. Um, so they are a butterfly like this. I think there's a little bit of difference between the males and the females. Um, I, I, I don't know too much about them, but I know that they are really iconic and they're really cool if you can see them and they are really low numbers in population. Okay, so the next ones are actually formally listed and are or have been listed as vulnerable for a long time. And the, the one I'm gonna highlight here is the prairie mole cricket. So the prairie mole cricket was proposed for listing back in the 80s, but it never went through. And I think that's because there's little known about it, but so we don't really know much about their numbers. So they have just been de defined and classified as vulnerable now. And they have a fascinating breeding ecology as well. 
because they, like the prairie chicken, actually set up Lex. So you wouldn't think a little bug has a little dance studio. Well, they don't have a dance competition Lex. What they have is they, they will dig a burrow that's shaped like a musical horn that amplifies their chirps so females can fly in to find a mate. So you can maybe see here, this isn't necessarily the best shot, but they've got these big, these legs in front that are just for digging. So they'll dig a, dig a burrow and then it'll amplify their sound. And then with all of them together, it'll bring in the, the females of the species so they can fly in and find where the prairie mole crickets occur. And the last one I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna try not to buzz through because it's my personal favorite, but I am a little bit over time already, is the American burying beetle. So these were the first endangered species of insect, and, but they have since been downgraded to the threatened. And interestingly, the population at Wakanta is listed as a non-essential experimental population. And that's because um, it's actually been reintroduced from a conservation program at St. Louis Zoo. And that's why you can see, actually, I think this is me that was handling one when we were helping with the reintroduction. So one of the things that preserves endangered species populations are captive breeding programs. Um, and then the St. Louis Zoo is, has been doing this one for the burying beetle for several years now. Um, and they've been reintroducing them across their whole range. And I think in Ohio and maybe even further east have been some areas that they have reintroduced the burying beetle, at least to raise numbers of the populations. So the American burying beetle is one of the largest species of beetle in North, North America. Um, and populations have rebounded enough to be delisted. Um, and actually I can tell you personally from handling these guys, for a beetle, they're insanely strong. You can, the amount of pushback they give when you're trying to put them in there, uh, reintroduce them into the wild is, is phenomenal. I could not believe just how strong these guys are. And the release period or the release protocol that they do is um, they, they get the burying beetle because they're kind of nature's undertaker. So they take small carcasses and they will bury them and then they will basically embalm them and then lay eggs on it. And then when these eggs hatch, the pupa or the larvae will eat the, the embalmed thing. But it's not quite that simple. And I know that already doesn't sound simple, but it's not that simple. The adults will actually stay around and make sure that the young are raised well and the, the, they will cooperatively raise the young. So they'll actually basically treat the, the larvae like birds would treat their nestlings, which is mind blowing again. So these guys are just, they're crazy cool. Um, but yeah, so they help raise their young, which is not something that insects basically do as a whole. And they are really cool because they help keep um, diseases off the ecosystem by taking care of these carcasses that would otherwise potentially rot or cause infections and cause, you know, unknown things to other wildlife in the area. And with that, I know I've gone over time, so I'm going to pass it back to Eric real quick. Thanks, Ke Thanks, Seb. Appreciate it. Um, since we just talked about uh, prairie chickens, I just wanted to show everyone I'm sporting my prairie chicken shirt here. Love those guys. Um, all right, so now we're going to get into more about Wakanta's role uh, in conserving the birds and other biota at Wakanta. So, what we're going to do here is um, talk about our research. So just a brief description about some of these photos here. So this is from this past season here. Um, and this is uh, our field technicians, Nick and Kyla. And they were a tremendous help uh, as we were uh, surveying and and looking for and monitoring grassland bird nests. And so what they're doing right here is they've got a rope with some tin cans kind of attached a couple, you know, a meter and a half from the rope. And they walk across this, uh, the grassland in a line uh, and they try to induce a flush. So oftentimes these birds are nesting in this, on the ground here and they'll stay tight on their nest when you're walking by, but if you create enough noise and you brush the vegetation that's right above it, you can get them to flush and then you can find the nest. So here's just uh, another image. It's similar. It's the same one that Zeb had in the beginning with that quail that was sitting on top here calling. Um, and then this beautiful Leconte sparrow that comes here later uh, in the fall. And then this was the image of uh, one of the savanna areas in Leconte. So let's get into our uh, breeding bird surveys, which was 
the first way that Murbo uh, became acquainted with Wakanta. So you know, Murbo has been conducting uh, breeding bird surveys at Wakanta among other grasslands around the state since 2013. And the purpose of our surveys uh, are to monitor trends in populations over time, and then also to examine how certain species might move about the landscape based on land, land management applications. So I showed you that photo of the burn. Um, and once we go through a survey, we can, we have a better understanding of what's using that and how many numbers before the burn and then what's there and what numbers after the burn. Um, and so here's an image of Joe from 2019, a really great birder here in Missouri and working for us uh, in 2019. And uh, he's got his chaps on, which are kind of essential in these tall grass prairies with a lot of uh, briar and, and other uh, thorny plants there. And he's getting ready to walk in there and we walk right through the prairie on these transects. So these are 400 meter lined transects that we walk and we, each surveyor typically does about six a day. You know, as it gets later in the day, the birds start to quiet down. So you can't really get as great of sampling. Um, and as you can see here, a lot of transects and it takes a few days to get all these done uh, with the survey. All right, so let's get into just what it looks like after we conduct a survey. So this is just a, the south area of Wakanta and you can see all these transects that we walk and all these yellow dots correspond to a bird detection. And some of these bird detections could be a pair, like this dick sissel could be a male and a female right there. So, you know, there, there are more individuals than are what are shown by the dots here. But, I mean, you can see, you know, this transect right here is a little sparse compared to this one right here. So this kind of information is useful for land managers as they uh, kind of, kind of uh, manage the land to see what's working for what bird and they can then find the technique that works best for what you know, species they want to conserve in particular and then uh, you know, follow through with that management and then you know, we're there to, to, to track the results. Um, so you know, a lot of birds as this title implies and so since 2013, we've recorded over 14,000 birds on Wakanta. So that's kind of averaging you know, I think it's like 1,750 birds a year uh, just using Wakanta. And as you can imagine, there's probably a lot of birds right in between our transects too that we're not getting. Um, so this is a great spot for our grassland obligate species uh, for breeding. And so we have a couple pictures here I just wanted to show you. So here's a male dick sissel with a grub there. Uh, an indigo bunting that's kind of transitioning its plumage. You have that, some of that blue there. And then this is a scissor tail flycatcher nest that was at Wakanta this year. And you can see she's sitting on her nest and she has that long tail. She can't keep that in the nest. So it's an easy uh, you know, giveaway. I knew she was sitting there and you can kind of make out the eye right here, just checking me out. So another thing that we can do with these survey results is calculate bird friendliness scores of each uh, area that we survey. So that uh, kind of uses a, a combined, a few different variables. Uh, one of them is that in the state of Missouri, there are conservation scores for each grassland obligate species. And so using those scores combined with you know, how many of each species there are at that property, we're able to calculate bird friendliness scores that kind of indicate how uh, high quality that habitat is. And you can see right here Wakanta Prairie with this orange uh, arrow pointing, it's you know, one of the highest in 2019. And what's even greater though to see is, uh, this is a private ranch that we survey, Thurs, and his is even higher, which is really comforting to know that there are private landowners owners that are committed to con conserving our Missouri birds. And then Dunn Ranch here, this is in the north part of the state and has this really high, the highest bird friendliness score. And uh, part of the reason why this is higher is that it has bobolinks and upland sandpipers that Wakanta doesn't have because bobolinks only uh, breed in northern part of Missouri. So if they 
decide to breed at Wakanta, then you know our numbers might be higher because as you can see, I mean, some when they're there, they're in high numbers, just like dick thistles. And then we have upland sandpipers here too, and they're present um, kind of scattered throughout the state and they tend to like a little bit more of a shorter grass. And so they were on thurs and which had cattle there grazing. So it was uh, kind of uh, conducive to upland sandpipers while Wakanta is a little too tall and thick for them uh, at, at this time. And then up in the top left, this is just a young scissor flycatcher. So that could have, it wasn't the same one, I don't think from the nest, but um, it's pretty cute. It doesn't have that long tail yet. All right, so now we'll kind of go into our fall migration project. And so um, Wakanta, Wakanta and Lindscombe are the two areas that Murbo has surveyed, surveyed consistently from 2016 to now. And that's what Matt and I are, are working on right now. So every day we go out and survey a portion of Wakanta and you saw that all those transects there. So it takes us about a week to hit every transect. Uh, and then once that, once we hit every transect, then we start over again. And so it kind of has uh, kind of one week intervals of, uh, you know, of, of when we survey and then break and then survey. And so you can see uh, over time, some, some changes in bird occupancy and what species are there. So these are two areas of the same grassland part in Wakanta. This is the Southeast part of Wakanta. And this is round one, which was, uh, this area was surveyed on the second, and then round five, and this was surveyed just a couple days ago. And some interesting things to point out are, so these are all the alpha codes, way that we can shorten uh, our common names there, so they're not as, so we don't have to, you know, we're kind of lazy, so we don't want to write up the whole name out, and it would be a little convoluted to have all those common names. So bevies are Bell's Vireo, and they're a summer breeder, and so they're kind of prolific throughout this area. And we had pretty high numbers early in September. And then, you know, skip to, you know, about four weeks and not a single Bell's Vireo on here. And instead, we have, you know, Vesper Sparrows. We have loggerhead Shrikes that are using this area. A lot of Northern Flickers all flying over. Um, and Savannah Sparrows. And we even had a Sprague's Pippet uh, come by, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so with the, since the past now, I guess, four years that we've been uh, conducting these fall migration surveys, we have a huge database of over 130,000 birds. Uh, and the majority of them are at Wakanta since Linscombe is a smaller area that just takes one day with Matt and I to cover while Wakanta takes, you know, five days. And so why we're doing this, uh, why we're participating in these surveys are, I mean, it really helps us with understanding timing of when certain birds are leaving their uh, summer home and when are the migrants coming through and when are the wintering birds uh, getting here and, and kind of setting up um, a territory and then occupancy and what numbers are these birds using the prairie? And of course, then management. This area was that same area I showed you that was burned uh, with that image overlooking. I was kind of up here and I was looking down and this whole area was burned. Hence, oh, sorry about that. Hence all the Savannah sparrows and Vesper sparrows. And there was even, if you saw on Facebook, the little quail, covey of quail that was scurrying across the prairie, that's right here. And so, um, you know, if this wasn't burned, I mean, we probably wouldn't have had those species there. So it's good to show immediate responses um, to the birding community there uh, related to management. And then, of course, climate change. Over time, as we've been conducting these surveys, are we seeing any differences uh, in, in uh, when these birds are getting here? Or, um, you know, so bobolinks, they might come over here in early September, we've had them. And then they're gone. They're kind of leaving now. We're getting fewer and fewer. But you know, has that changed since 2016? And it 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 just might, it's just something to consider as we continue these surveys um, as a potential influencer to these uh, migration patterns. 
So here's some uh, fall migration result examples. And so I won't get into the weeds too much about this, but I think it's worth showing. So in summer when we're doing our breeding bird surveys, uh, primarily we're detecting these birds sing by singing. So we're hearing a lot of singing males, you know, cacophony of sounds throughout the prairie. But in fall, a lot of these birds aren't singing and we're just hearing little call notes. And that's really evident by uh, this pie chart here showing that calling is um, kind of the largest way that we detect these birds. And so um, Matt and I and other surveyors, we really have to tune into these bird calls and, and practice these calls because, um, let's see, I think I have a couple calls on here. Let's see if these will work. Might have to turn up. Hopefully you can hear that. Is that, could you hear that at all? Not really. Yeah. Anyways, they're just really tiny little peeps. Little chips. All right. Well, I just added in last second as, um, so that way I didn't have to try to make those sounds myself. Um, but these are just some examples of some of the birds that we're seeing out there. Uh, like this sedren, Lincoln sparrow, and swamp sparrow. And you wouldn't think about it, but, or you wouldn't kind of uh, instinctively think that swamp sparrows are present on the grassland. But as you see here on this graph, which shows number of detections on the y-axis, and then the dates that we survey, you know, September 1st to mid-November, you can see swamp sparrow right here, which is the gray color. It's a huge bulk of our detections of key grassland fall uh, birds. And so it's really uh, interesting to know that despite being a grassland, these swamp sparrows really love that tall, kind of rank, wet grassland. And because we have all that, that tall grass, I mean, it gets dewy every day. And I think Matt can tell you it's wet every day we go out there. And so these sedge wrens and swamp sparrows love that. Um, but this graph just highlights you know, when these birds are coming in and arriving at the prairie. So, you know, sedge wrens, they'll be up in northern Missouri, so they don't have to come far, and they're here throughout most of uh, our surveys, and then they have a big spike in October, or early October, and then kind of taper off, and that's kind of the trend for a lot of these birds, just like this Lincoln Sparrow here. I mean, Lincoln Sparrow, we've had a few this past week, and then they get a high spike in mid October, and then we just get a few that kind of linger, and then um, even into November we have a few. But you know, it shows a lot of these birds are coming through in in small numbers first, big numbers, and then a lot of them are leaving, and some are are staying a little bit longer. And so this is just from our 2016 this uh, compiled data set from 2016 to 2019. Um, and so these type of trends are are interesting to note. Uh, and one of the reasons why we are continuing the surveys. All right, so now we'll get into grassland bird nest monitoring background. Uh, and this is my favorite project. I love nest searching. It's really fun. Um, so, um, but I'll try not to get too much into the weeds about this. So uh, we came on in 2016 as part of a 15 year study that the MDC the Department of Conservation here is uh, conducting, which is aiming to assess the effects of patch burning and grazing. So this map right here shows the uh, patch burn grazing site at Wakanta, and they have a few of these around Southwest Missouri, and we concentrate uh, here at Wakanta as well as Taborville, which is just Taborville Prairie, which is just you know 15 miles north of our uh, field house there, and. So what they do with this study is they burn a third of each unit. This is the control here, and this is the treatment. So each treatment and control gets a third of the area burned every year. And so then you have one that's just been burned, one that had a year rest, and then one that had two year rest. And then the same application goes to the treatment area, except in the treatment area, they have cattle grazing there. So it's trying to assess um, you know, all types of biota responses to this management plan, and we're there to kind of serve as or assess grassland birds 
and their nests uh, as a result of this uh, management. And so from May to early August, we're out there every day looking for and, uh, and monitoring these nests. And this is just another image of uh, Nick and Kyla. And we have our um, sticks that we use. This, these are just lightweight, extendable fishing poles that we'll use to kind of uh, induce flushes similar to the rope that we used in that previous image. And so we'll walk in a line and we'll kind of wave this stick back and forth across this vegetation because as we're walking, some of them will just sit, sit tight on the ground. But when you move that um, stick, it helps kind of create enough disturbance that they, the birds get provoked and feel like they need to get off the nest uh, because they're in peril. But lucky for them, they're not. And we just collect the data and check on it periodically until they uh, succeed or fail. So we'll get into a little bit of the results and I don't want this to be too overwhelming. Uh, it's relatively simple and I'll break it down for you a little bit. Um, so I've kind of extracted just the uh, Wakanta data and we were conducting, we've been conducting our nest marching project at Taborville uh, a little bit more and it's also a bigger site. So we have probably, you know, maybe 60 something percent more nests there because we're about, I mean, maybe 800 nests or so. Um, but anyways, this is kind of a breakdown of all the species nests that we've found and monitored at Wakanta. So we're totaling here at 324 nests. And here we have a breakdown of all the nests that we've found. And some of them are not the target species, but our target species are this Bell's Vireo here. We have 76 nests of those. Thick Sissels, 43, which surprisingly, Wakanta, at the, that area, doesn't have a lot of dick sissels, uh, contrary to uh, Taborville, which has, is loaded with them. Field sparrows, grasshopper sparrows, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, it's pretty tall and thick at Wakanta, so it's surprising that we even have some grasshopper sparrows. And then Henslow sparrows, our target species, and then our northern bobwhite quail. Um, and then move over to this next uh, table and this shows just success and failures of those nests and then percent success and this is a little bit inflated because this doesn't take uh, into consideration nests that we haven't found and likely were failed so there's some uh, analysis that we use that considers that so these are a little bit inflated um, and so we're at about a 32.4 percent success rate for uh, kind of the aggregate of uh, nests that we found and then move over to um, kind of the, the variables, the treatment and the control. So this one had the grazers and this one doesn't have grazers, but also burns. And you can see our target species in green. Overall, we've found a lot more nests in the treatment area. It seems to be very productive. However, it's not, they don't have a high, as high of a success rate in the control. And it's too early to say, you know, what exactly is the, the reasoning for this um, contrast, but I calculated this, and this is sitting at around a you know 25% success rate, and here 36 to 57, it's sitting closer to a 38% success rate, which is pretty high for grassland species. Um, and then down here, this table shows uh, brown-headed cowbird parasitism rates, and I thought I'd throw this in here, and a lot of you all probably know that cowbirds are brood parasites. Um, and so they lay their eggs in other birds' nests and let the hosts uh, raise their young for them. And the ones I put in highlighted with red are the ones that have really high um, parasitism rates. And that's our Bell's Vireo. They tend to have pretty exposed nests and they have a, you know, close to 34% parasitism rate. And then our yellow-breasted chat, 50%. And I mean, you could see here, I mean, they only have a 14% success rate, and that could be in part due to their high parasitism rates. Um, but it's also interesting to show that so a lot of these species don't have any parasitism, and some of these species recognize their eggs, and others, like grasshopper sparrow with, with zero, they can get parasitized, but they have such hard to find cryptic nests, and and so and we have a hard time finding them. So I think the cowbirds have a hard time finding them too. And that's the reason. 
Same with the hens or sparrows, only 20% there. But overall, 17.8% parasitism rate for our birds' nests that we monitored at Wakanta. And to kind of uh, end, I just wanted to show you some of the bird nest photos that I've collected over the year that are uh, on more of the prettier side. So I'll just briefly go over all these because I know I'm running out of time. And so right here we have Northern Mockingbird. Then right here we have Eastern Meadowlark Young. And they're about ready to fledge. You have an Eastern Kingbird nest. And they tend to like to nest in those draws where there's it's kind of closer to water. There's more woodier vegetation. You can see right here, there's even water right there. This is that Bell's Vireo nest. And they nest just like other Vireos in a uh, kind of weed cup. And so the cowbirds just can sit right here on the edge and lay their egg in there. And I've seen you know three cowbird eggs in one of these nests and the nest can't really hold up very well, but they love to use spider webs in there. And then here we have a grasshopper sparrow nest and a grasshopper sparrow nest with the young that just hatched. Here's a blue winged warbler nest, which unfortunately didn't make it because look at these huge cowbird eggs that hatched before it. Here's a Henslow sparrow's nest, gray catbird with these real glossy blue eggs, indigo bunting with these matted white eggs. Here's a young Bell's Vireo that was telling me not to eat them. And I didn't, don't worry. Um, then we have American goldfinch nest here and you know six eggs in this cowbird egg. And it's real interesting to, to look at how the difference between cowbird egg coloring and, and in general, just egg colors and patterns uh, that vary within species are pretty interesting uh, that I've noticed kind of, you know, anecdotally. Um, we have a Dixisle nest right here, a field sparrow nest with a young field sparrow that's uh, kind of resting its weak little neck on its, on its brethren there. And then we have a, a red-winged blackbird nest that has, this is kind of characteristic of other blackbird eggs where they have those like paint um, kind of splotches, like someone just had a paintbrush and threw paint on it. Um, and here's uh, hatching dick sisals. And then here's the yellow-breasted chat. And of course, look at this cowbird egg right there, but really nice looking eggs. All right, that's all I've got here. So I'm gonna pass this off now to Matt. And thanks for sticking with me, guys. I hope we didn't rush through and talk too much. Okay. So lastly, we wanted to put together a little guide on um, what you might expect to see when you visit. Because um, I, I don't know, I, I have really loved, have, have grown to love um, Wakanta, and I certainly think that it's um, underappreciated. Um, so spring, um, one of the things that really struck me um, when I first started visiting Wakanta was the bird diversity. Um, just over the past few days, um, we've had, oh gosh, 10 or so warbler species, Canada warbler, palm warbler. Um, I had a northern perula today, orange crown warbler. Um, and so I, I guess I had this impression that it, it was strictly grassland birds, um, really low diversity, which is, which is not at all the case. So I'm um, really looking forward to visiting again in the spring now that I know where all the good little pockets um, of good habitat are, um, I'm really looking forward to coming back and, and checking out the birds again in the spring. Um, in April, the wildflowers really um, start to take off out there, um, which is, is really beautiful. And then um, right about April as well, all the reptiles start to emerge. Um, so they've been cold all, all winter and they, once, once the days start to get a little bit warmer, they come out in the sun um, and start looking for mates. So here's, um, I know Zeb touched on just a couple of these. Here's, um, here's the wildflowers that start blooming. Um, shoots is a perennial favorite. Um, so these, these shooting stars that grow out on the prairie are, are much larger and more robust than, than the same species if it were to grow in woodland. Um, Indian paint, paintbrush, um, like Zeb said, is, is my one of my favorites as well. This is partially parasitic. So this Indian paintbrush likes to latch onto the roots of, of little blue stem. 
um, and then this camas and bergamot are, are great for pollinators. Um, like this ruby-throated hummingbird that, that loves to visit all these wildflowers out on the prairie. And I, I like having hummingbirds at the feeder as much as the next guy, but seeing, you know, 30 a day zooming and zipping on all these little wildflowers across the prairie was um, really, really incredible. Um, here's some of the herps that, that start coming out in the spring. Um, there are definitely multiple species of water snakes on all these little, little ponds. Um, ornate box turtles and three-toed box turtles. Um, there's not good habitat to support um, cottonmouths. So I, I wouldn't necessarily be worried about, about cottonmouths out there. Copperheads, maybe, um, kind of around, around the fringe where there's a little more woodland. Um, rattlesnakes are unlikely too. So uh, I would be aware of venomous snakes, but um, definitely wouldn't be worried about them, um, which is why I'm picking all these guys up. Um, so there's great habitat for milk snakes. Um, this bull snake here is Missouri's largest snake. So these get about six feet long. And this thing is just all muscle. This thing was hefty. Um, we get Great Plains skinks out there, broad-headed skinks. Um, so it's, it's definitely not, you know, I never worry about the snakes biting me. I get bitten messing with these skinks way more than anything else. Whoops. Um, summer. So summer is a good chance to see some of these um, target birds that Eric was talking about. Um, it, it can be tricky to find yellow-breasted chats like this guy or Bell's Vireos and, and some of these little um, grassland sparrows in, in other habitats. So it's, um, summer kind of has a reputation for being the doldrums of, of birding, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I've, I've really loved, you know, coming out and taking pictures of the, of the Henslows singing away in, in the middle of the summer. Um, this is Bell's Vireo. Gray cat birds are out there. Um, they make a sound like a little kitten. Um, and some of these are pretty secretive too. So it's um, a good, good chance to see some kind of secretive birds. Eastern toeys um, are singing out there. They're, they're pretty timid. So um, good place to visit in the summer for birding. This is the Henslows, like Eric was talking about. This is one of our target species. Um, Henslows sparrow has been declared um, at risk in, in seven, um, seven different states. So it's, it's a you know, tricky bird to find, really, um, really particular habitat. So birders come from all over to try to, to, try to get get their Henslow sparrows. Um, so I, I would encourage anybody to come out in the middle of the summer and, and see some of these Henslows singing away. Um, they, they have a really subtle kind of uh, insect-like song that's, that's really bizarre, but, but really cool. Um, fall, we are coming up on um, Leconte's sparrow season. So this, this is a um, Leconte's sparrow that, that start showing up um, early to mid-October, so there very well could be some out there right now, is the, the pumpkin spice of uh, fall birding. So I'm, I'm always really, really looking forward to when these Leconte sparrows come through, and they don't, they don't hang around long. Um, part of why Leconte sparrows um, are so sought after is because they only hang around um, four to six weeks, and, and they're off. Um, so you got to get out, get out to the grassland to see some of these really beautiful little Halloween birds. Um, reptiles start to kind of emerge again in the fall. They, they take a bit of a lull in the summer as well. Um, when the days start getting hotter, some, some species of reptiles start getting increasingly nocturnal. Um, so in the fall, when, when the days start cooling down a little bit, they come out more during the day, so um, it's another good chance to go go look for snakes and turtles. 
Um, wildflowers too, you know, there are different species, different species of wildflowers bloom at different times. Um, so fall is, is still a good time to go look for wildflowers and then butterflies. There's more wildflowers. Um, so here's our monarch butterfly. Um, I've, I've been seeing a gob of them. Well, I guess up until a couple days ago, I, I was seeing a gob of them on, on all the wildflowers out at Wakanta. Um, and why this is, um, is because their migration northward in the spring um, is, is very gradual. So it takes multiple generations to get um, to, to go through North America. It takes multiple generations. Um, and then on the way back home, it's a straight shot. It's, it's one generation. So the um, same butterfly that was at Wakanta or um, at Iowa or where, wherever on the Great Plains flies a straight shock back down to the mountains of, of central Mexico. So we get this huge uh, influx of monarchs out on the prairie all at once is, is a sight to behold. Um, and then winter. So our, our summer sparrows are, are pretty small. Most of them, you know, field sparrows and uh, lacans and grasshopper sparrows are all pretty tiny. Um, and then in the winter, we get these, these bigger, um, bigger sparrows, like this Harris's sparrow, um, white crowns is a fox sparrow. Um, so really, just, just in general, Wakanta is a great place to go um, see many, many species of sparrows, and then raptors as well. So this is our um, red-tailed hawk. This is a juvenile here. Um, in the winter, however, all of the subspecies that breed across Canada, all of the subspecies of red-tailed hawks, um, kind of disperse down into the United States. Um, so during the summer, where we might only get one subspecies of red-tailed hawk, in the winter we'll get several. Um, and they, they like that open, um, open area. So Wakanta is a great place to see a really diverse selection of red-tailed hawks in winter. Um, but this also applies for, for several other raptors. Um, Northern harriers kind of do the same thing. Rough-legged hawks. Um, Wakanta is great habitat for rough-legged hawks too. And then snowy owls. Um, I, for one, will be patrolling for snowy owls out there um, this winter. Um, they only they only follow that pattern on on certain years they call them eruption years um, so we we had an eruption year a couple couple years ago um, so it's it's not a for sure thing but wakanta is appropriate habitat if we fall in one of those eruption years um, what is erupting right now are these red-breasted nut hatches um, which is about the last thing i expected to see surveying the prairie in September in October were, were gobs of red-breasted nuthatches. So this was taken, um, I don't know, a week ago. Here in a couple slides, I have, have one that I took this morning. Um, so these red-breasted nuthatches during eruption years um, all kind of bleed southward onto the Great Plains. And, and right now there's um, a million of them tooting away from the trees around Wakanta. Um, and then frost flowers. Um, so in or short, shortly after the first couple of hard freezes, um, kind of while the ground is, is still re relatively warm, but the air, but the air is cold, um, there are a few species of native plants that will rupture kind of along, along the stem. Um, all gets, this is all ruptured, oops, ruptured when it freezes, but the ground is warm enough that the roots continue to send up sap into the plant. Um, so this sap freezes as soon as it hits this cold air and kind of creates these ribbons of, of really, really thin, thin ribbons of frozen sap that form around the base of a few species of, um, of the plants out of Wakanta. Uh, really, 
beautiful. And then after a few hours, when it, when it warms up just a little bit, they disappear. Um, so when is the best time to visit Wakanta? Anytime. I am convinced that there is never a dull day out there. Um, today, I was surveying a newly acquired tract kind of on the north, north end of Wakanta. Um, that was all um, pasture. Um, but I had several species of warblers, like I said, red-breasted nuthatches. Um, there's always um, northern bobwhite quail out there. Um, goldfinches galore. This is the red-breasted nuthatch from this morning. Um, was just tooting away up in a little tree on my survey. And then this is a palm warbler from, from yesterday. So, um, I don't know, something I've learned from surveying for, for Merbo over the past couple of years is, is that there's never, um, never a dull morning. If, if you be on the lookout, I, I've absolutely found something interesting every day. And then here's a little grasshopper sparrow. So um, that is all I've got. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for bringing it home. Okay, so we have gone a little bit over our time, but we're still going to stick around for questions. And I will also remind you, if you do have to go, we are going to record this, or we have recorded it, and we are going to put the recording up on the website eventually. So you can check back for questions later. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in, and Eric has been diligently answering some in the chat. So we will get through some of these questions. And if you have any more last minute questions or comments, feel free to keep typing while we talk. So. Thanks again for joining us. Um, I'm going to start off with some kind of, I guess we'll go kind of rapid fire here for some methods questions for you, Eric. So the first one uh, was how long does it take to survey a single transect? Uh, yeah, so I would say on average, it takes about a half hour to cover a transect, but it tends to vary uh, because in the earlier part of the morning, it's just birdier, it's busier, there's more bird activity. And so there's a lot more time spent, you know, looking down on our phones, which are how we record all those birds and plot them. Uh, it just takes more effort to capture and record all those birds into your phone. So it tends to take a little bit longer, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. And then later in the season, I mean, later in the day, then it dies down a little bit. Um, maybe the, the wind starts picking up and you can't detect as much. Um, and so it, you know, will go down to maybe 20 minutes, but it tends to average out into a half hour. And so that's why we do our kind of about six, you know, maybe seven transects in morning because, you know, by the time we finish, it's 10 o'clock and then the winds pick up at, you know, winds pick up and then all the birds have kind of, uh, you know, waiting until maybe in the late afternoon to start uh, being more active. Excellent. So, yeah. So that was, that's the perfect answer to it. If you guys were with us last week, the, the grassland ones are generally a little bit quicker than the wetlands ones, but it's about the same. It's the same procedure. Uh, if you can check back for that one, that's kind of how we do it. Um, I was totally going to say something else to that. But yeah, so we ha that's why it takes a week to do Wakanta is because we, we try and match when the birds are active to do our surveys. So we're not just out there not properly catching what we see. The next two are about the nesting project. And so one question is, are you ever concerned about stepping on a nest? All the time, every day, every few minutes, I think about it. It's a constant struggle. And um, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've never stepped on a nest knowingly, uh, but sometimes when you're walking, there's just, you, the whole grassland is you know, sufficient habitat to support nests. Um, depending on the species. And so when you're in kind of ripe habitat, you just kind of have to pay attention a little bit and maybe avoid some of the tufts of grass with, you know, kind of the dead thatch that's leaning over, which some of those cr more cryptic ground nesters like the henslows and meadowlarks really like to nest in. Um, so I think you, it just takes practice, but like sometimes you're walking, I like to cover a lot of ground every day when I walk. And so I walk fast and with the hills and how uneven the surface is, it's, 
it's you you can't walk gingerly all the time and so i think about it all the whole project <laughs> yeah and i i know when i was doing my surveys too you usually try i'm always on extra alert if you do happen to flush up a bird right near where you're walking because then you you really wonder if there's a nest right next to that um okay Next one with the nesting is, is success all or nothing? What if a few eggs are lost, but some hatch? Is that a success? Uh, so in regards to hatching, we keep monitor, monitoring until they fledge. Um, if some don't hatch or if some um, are, you know, maybe some are missing after another check and there's just one young in there, it's we, it's still considered active until we check it and determine if it's you know if they had fledged or not fledged and so it's as long as one host young is uh kind of deemed that it fledged it's success yep and that's based on that's a kind of the scientific consensus for nest monitoring is if there is one successful hatch it's considered a successful nest. That's what all of the scientific literature typically goes with. Um, okay, so Eric answered a couple of the questions in the chat about what time of year the controlled burns are. That's generally early spring or winter. Sometimes they do some in the beginning of the or late fall too. Um, the white webbing on the Belzvirio nest was spider web actually. And then I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the, the cowbird egg one, how we don't remove them. Um, cowbird eggs, it's, it's technically illegal to remove them because they are a protected species. They are a native of the area. Um, it's a it's an ecological strategy to do brood parasitism. That's how they survive year to year. So we can't, you can't remove them. That's just how, how it is <laughs> um, because they are a native species. They just happen to parasitize other native species. Um, and then what other ones are in there? The indigo bunting nest. This one I actually kind of wanted to follow up with. Um, you hadn't found very many indigo bunting nests, but um, I'm assuming you said because there's scrubby habitat that they tend to find or they tend to nest in. Do they nest on the ground or they do, do they nest higher too? Uh, they nest kind of about like three feet up in okay. vegetation. Um, and this past year we found four, and we found more at Taborville. Those were just at Wakanta. Taborville has some more woody areas that are included in the search area. So we do have more, um, but it's not, they're not as present. I mean, you can hear them singing all around in the draws and they're probably, you know, in those riparian areas, but those are off limits in our search area because they don't get the same management. Excellent. All right, so now I wanna grab Matt for one question. And this one was, um, they were asking about the eruption years. Can you explain why it happens some years and not others? Um, do you wanna address that I'm at all? Not, I'm not incredibly familiar with it. And I, I, as far as I know, I think there's some debate actually as, as to why it happens. I, I think it's um, tied to food availability. Um, you know, I've, I've heard for like snowy owls, um, you know, after, um, after lemmings or something have, have a really good year up in the Arctic, um, like the following year, since, since all these owls had all this abundant food and then the following year, if, if there were fewer mammals, um, then all of these birds need to, need to disperse to, to find food. Um, the finches, I'm, I'm much finches and nut hatches. I'm much less less familiar with, and I, I know I, I know it's really complicated. I, I have a really tenuous grasp on it. Yeah, I think that's that's a great answer for it. Um, we know that they do this eruption, and so when things move out of their kind of normal range, or they'll just like move in mass into new areas. And as Matt said, it, it varies largely by species. Each one does have, they have different ecologies. So like the owls have different, different things that they rely on than the, the nuthatches and the finches. I tried reading up the nuthatches and I think it has something to do with, I think it was the insect populations in the spring causes some of their movement, but it's, it's, I don't think it's settled science either, but yeah. So a lot of the time we don't know, we just know there are some years that a lot of these birds move here in areas that they're not usually um, found in. Okay, um, 
COVID-19 has impacted a lot of field work all over the world and various agencies have had reductions in modifications of field activities. Has COVID had any impact on your surveys this year? Do you want to address that one, Eric? Sure, uh, absolutely it has. We focused a lot more on the nest searching project since the two work sites are, you know, with max 15 minutes from the field house here. And so we restricted our travel quite a bit. Uh, we didn't survey nearly as many sites as we normally do because we didn't want to drive, a, you know, far and risk any type of, uh, you know, getting flat tires and having to go get it patched in some place or stopping at gas stations. Um, or, you know, it's just a lot of uncertainty that's involved when you have to travel around. So we, we kept it within a uh, 45 minute radius of the house and completed all the sites we could within the area. But um, I mean, to my benefit, since I love the nest searching project, we really focus on that and had a really successful year, and, you know, and we just focused on the target species this year compared to the past years where we monitored others. And it was, um, it turned out to be uh, real, real beneficial, you know, all, all things considered. Yeah, and I'll mention too, like we've had the, the field house in Wakanda, uh, not in Wakanda, in El Dorado, we've had for several years now. So we've already had the kind of the area set up and and that's been part of it that hasn't, this reduced the amount of travel for sure too. Um, okay, so now I'm, I made the mistake of talking about the cowbird thing. So somebody else asked another question. And the question is, can you remind us of why the cowbirds developed this habit? Did it have something to do with the bison that, the, that used to occur? Do you, do you want to, either you guys want to answer this one or? I can, but if you want to, I've been talking a lot, if you want to. Um, I'm trying to okay. refine the question. You cut out a little bit. Oh, um, so somebody wanted a reminder of why the cowbirds developed this habit of brood parasitism. Do you want to answer that? Does it have something to do with bison? Go for it, Eric. Uh, sure. So that is what everybody has been ornithologist has always thought. Um, I've heard some new research that, or some thoughts, not even research, that it might not be bison, but it, the consensus right now is that it has to do with bison movement and that cowbirds, you know, like their name implies, they like to follow the cattle and pick bugs and seeds off, off the ground there um, in where the cattle pass through. And so as they migrate with these nomadic, um, you know, grazers, they just don't have time to make a nest, sit on the nest, raise their young, uh, and be with that same cattle herd or bison herd. So they use that as a strategy. They, you know, find nests in the nearby area and lay eggs in there. So that way they can keep going with the bison. Um, the one thing I heard that was kind of suggesting that maybe that isn't the, um, what actually happened was that we, we know that, you know, that cowbirds check on the nests throughout the, um, throughout the early stages when they lay their egg, they check on it a few times. And so would they have, would this have strategy existed for them if they checked on their nests or is that some, because, you know, if they wouldn't have time, maybe if the cattle was kept moving, they wouldn't have time to check back. So has that been a, um, you know, behavior that has evolved over time now that they can be more sedentary uh, and don't rely on the cattle? Or is it that, you know, they just, the, the bison don't move that fast. And so they can fly and they're fly, you know, they're birds, so they can cover huge distances and they know where it is and they check on it and then, you know, go, you know, whatever tens of miles back to the herd. Um, so that's something that I've just heard been explored a little bit, but I think right now it, it is the fact that they need to stay with the bison and they don't have time to raise their own. Yeah, I think that you, you nailed it. That's, that's the consensus and even the new, like, we don't know for sure. There's always, always more to be researched, I think is a good, good takeaway from that. And then I had one thing in the chat that mentioned that they like my, my American Burying Beetle pin, which you can kind of see. Eric was showing off his t-shirt, so I had to go find my pin and put it on. Because I was really, I, it was such a cool thing to talk about and such a cool thing to experience. 
Um, it was back in 2015, I was able to help with that very beautiful release. And so we got to talk with the guys and talk with the people that run the breeding program. And it's just a, it's a really cool thing. And it was, it was super fun and super informative and a nice break from our day. Cause as, as Eric mentioned, when we have these, these surveys we do in the mornings and we have the afternoons kind of to ourselves, there are, when there are other things going on, we like to try and get involved and try and help out with it, especially in the conservation realm. So awesome. I don't know. I don't see any more questions. If you guys have any other final comments or final thoughts, we can go to that or we will just tell everybody have a good night, evening. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for sticking it out. I know we went a little bit long and we talked a lot, but you know, this is a prairie that we've all spent a fair amount of time on and near and dear to my heart. And, you know, I kind of jokingly say this, but you know, that's a, I could see myself getting married out there in Wakanda. It's that great. So <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to share my love of this prairie with all you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks for attending. It's, it's a real treat to, to talk about that place. It's um, been really great. Indeed, I, I will just echo that. It was awesome. And again, thank you very much for attending and stay tuned for our upcoming webinars and check out our website and probably you'll get our emails too and everything. But yeah, thanks again. And I am going to call it a night for us all. So see you next time. Bye guys.